Thank you very much, Mr. Curtin. Uh, we'll now move to Mr. Lepp, please. Ten minutes. Hello, my name is Grayson Lepp, and I'm the financial coordinator and executive chair of the UBC Students Union Okanagan, Local 3 of the Canadian Federation of Students. I was arrested after participating in a peaceful rally planned to coincide with the recent G20 summit in Toronto. Despite what some pundits would have you believe, however, I am neither a thug nor a hooligan. I am in fact a university student about to graduate from the management program at UBC Okanagan. I was in Toronto not to attack the city, as has been alleged, but to highlight the importance of public education here in Canada and around the world. I was sent by the executive of my students' union to represent the some 7,000 students of UBC Okanagan. For my efforts, I became one of the victims of the largest mass arrest in Canadian history. I was placed under arrest for a variety of trumped up charges and denied my basic civil rights. My colleague Kirk Chevry and I arrived in Toronto on the morning of June 26th and took public transit to the University of Toronto, which was the muster point for a rally organized by the Canadian Federation of Students. Upon arriving around 7 a.m. to an empty campus, we were cut off by a police cruiser which jumped the curb onto the sidewalk blocking our path. The police proceeded to bend us over the hood of the cruiser and rummage through our belongings. They went through our bags and read through all of our text messages on our phones and even confiscated an article of clothing from myself. At this point, they told us that if we stayed out of trouble, we would in turn not be troubled by the police. Unfortunately, this turned to, out to be untrue. Later that day, we participated in a peaceful, well-planned and organized rally in favor of public education. We marched through downtown Toronto and we witnessed no acts of violence, neither against people nor property. When we arrived at Queen and Spadina, we were told that we should go no closer to the site of the G20 meetings, as we would most likely be arrested if we did so. And we certainly did not want to become arrested. At this point, we were told that the rally was basically over, and so we decided to do a little sightseeing. We had dinner at the Red Room pub and then decided to retire for the night. We have been told that the gymnasium owned by the University of Toronto Student Society had been set aside as a hostel for visiting students free of charge. So in order to save on costs, we decided to stay there for the night. The next morning at around 9 a.m. on June the 27th, I was awoken at gunpoint. I was kicked and cursed at by an officer in ride gear. I will not go into details as to what the officer said unless the committee asks for it and was told to wake up. I looked around the room to see other people being subjected to the same rough treatment. One young man who had the audacity to ask what was going on was grabbed by the throat and slammed against the wall by a police officer. At this point, we were told we were being charged with unlawful assembly. We were placed in zap straps, which were briefly taken off so we could be paraded in front of the media in handcuffs. Other than this brief respite, however, we remained in zap straps for around 16 hours. We were then escorted to the Eastern Avenue Detention Center and placed in the holding cages there. I say cages because I feel that to call them cells is an insult to holding cells everywhere. These were cages made of modular fencing and were around 10 foot by 20 foot. And despite the small size, these cages were crowded with upwards of 30 people. We were not given toilet paper for over 12 hours. We were not given water for another two hours after that. I saw people detained, denied basic medical treatment, including one diabetic man who was denied access to insulin until he fell into shock. And I saw off an officer even make a death threat against a man in my cell. What had the man done to provoke the officer? He'd simply had the audacity to ask for more water. I was detained for approximately 40 hours and never granted a phone call. Luckily, I was able to see a lawyer, one that had been hired on my behalf by the Canadian Federation of Students. She told me that she'd been looking for me for over a day. After around 36 hours, I was told that the charge against me was conspiracy to commit an indictable offense to wit mischief over $5,000 and not unlawful assembly as I had previously been told. Throughout the entire ordeal, I was never treated as a citizen of Canada, a citizen that had the right to engage in peaceful protest. Instead, I was treated as an invading alien whose supposed rights were an inconvenience to the police who were supposed to be there for my safety. Good afternoon. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kirk Shavery, and I'm the external coordinator for the UBC Students Union Okanagan, Local 3 of the Canadian Federation of Students. 
Currently, I am pursuing a Bachelor of Fine Arts. My experiences in Toronto on June the 26th to the 29th were much the same as my colleague Grayson's. I experienced many of the same things he did. In Eastern Avenue Detention Center, however, we were separated and weren't reunited until I was finally released, some two days later. I want to reinforce much of what Grayson has said and comment on my own experiences in the detention center. Like Grayson, I saw people being denied basic, basic Medicare. There was a young man in my cell who repeatedly vomited on the floor and simply laid in it afterwards, too weak to move. Despite this obvious medical emergency, he was granted no care, as the officers assigned to our cell deemed him to be fine. The cell was also not clean the whole entire time I was there. So the rest of us were forced to stand next to this puddle of vomit and, once the toilet eventually overflowed, a puddle of urine and feces. Also like Grayson, I witnessed systemic discrimination against Francophone detainees. The officers assigned to our cell seemed to be unaware that Canada has two official languages, English and French. This ignorance prompted them to tell us that those detainees who spoke fluent English would be processed first. However, if you spoke French, or if the officers deemed your English was not good enough, you were sent to the back of the line. I am told that the integrated security unit contained a detachment from the Montreal City Police. Presumably, these officers would have been able to process francophone inmates, but it seems they were not available to do so. Still to this day, I am unsure why not. Unlike Grayson, the police made a token effort to fulfill my right to a phone call. After I begged the officers assigned to my cage for over 12 hours, I was glad that my civil rights were finally being recognized and respected. Firstly, because I believed them to be important. And secondly, because I had promised to call my parents on a regular basis and had been unable to do so for 24 hours at this point. I was marched by an officer into a small room which contained a bank of phones, one of which was off the hook and being held by another officer. He told me that this was who I probably wanted to talk to. And I said that I wanted to call my mother to reassure that I was alive and well and to get her to coordinate a lawyer for me. The officer then cursed at me and ordered me to answer the phone. So I did. The person on the other line told me that she was shocked at, what, at the situation I was in and that she'd get help, and then she hung up. Apparently, the police didn't consider this to be my phone call. This was typically the way the police treated the civil rights of detainees as a trivial, bottom detail to be sorted out at the officer's convenience. I never received a phone call. I was held for over two days, processed and released on bail without ever seeing a lawyer. And for those two days, I languished in a freezing urine-soaked cage that I wouldn't wish on a dog. Like Grayson, I was eventually charged with conspiracy to commit an indictable offense with mischief up to $5,000. The charges against me have been dropped, and I still am told what evidence the police had against me. However, this is merely a point of interest, as I know what evidence the police had against me. None. I just want to hear them admit it. Grayson and I, until quite recently, had a great deal of faith in the Canadian government. It was my firm belief that here in Canada, at least, civil rights were sacred, and if they were violated, the government would work to make restitution. That faith has been severely damaged, perhaps forever. I now see that my civil rights are a mere inconvenience to be set aside for the benefit of a small group of visiting dignitaries. On behalf of Grayson Lepp and myself, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. It is my hope that in the first step down the long road to justice for the G20 detainees and to restoring the damaged face in the government of Canada, the next logical step is a review with full judicial powers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh